Welcome to the land of Kakiak. My name is Laurel and I homeschool my three boys using the Robinson curriculum as the base of our education. Today I was going to talk to you a little bit about my home library. When I did my updated schoolroom tour video a while back I showed the shelves um, that my husband built for me and a couple people asked to or expressed that I'd like to see more of what's on the shelves. Ooh, my favorite book talk. <laughs> I thought I would just show you a little bit, um, I might have to, I'll probably have to do this in more than one video, a little bit of what's on the shelf, some of my favorite picks. I have not actually used everything that I own. I feel like it's kind of like that nesting habit that women have where we want to gather everything that we think that we'll need, even if we're not using it yet because we're planning into the future. So there's some stuff I've got in here that I actually haven't used yet. I'll sh I can show it to you, but I don't know that I'll have, I can tell you why I got it, but I may not have like a final word on it. You know what I mean? So the way that my little home library is organized is roughly by subject. I just, you know, things for science, things for math, things for history, things for um, our Robinson curriculum, reading list books. I try to group things together things for writing, things for spelling, things for handwriting. So like with like, you know, that, that's easiest for me. And then I try to just grab what I need when I am working with the kids, like whatever their set curriculum is for a t uh, frame of time. And then I'll pull, take those off the shelf and I'll actually set them aside. So I actually have a section, one of the bookshelves is just for my two youngest sons. William's stuff is, is on the right and then Bo's is right next to it on the left. So I can just go over because I'm still working with them a lot. So I'm grabbing things off the shelf in the morning. My middle schooler has a basket where the stuff that he uses on a daily basis is just in the basket. And we just kind of stick it under the table, the homeschool table. And he just gets out what he needs and put it, puts it back. And then when he's done with it for the year, we'll just reshelve it, you know. That said, kind of organization stuff out of the way. Let me grab something to show you. So the first is new. I only, I only grabbed um, three. There are 12 of these. This is a book set, my book house. And they've been publishing these for a long time. I think this set is from the 70s, but there's much older copies out there. I just bought a used set off of eBay. And let me just kind of show you what they are. So book number one in the nursery. I just, you guys, I'm a sucker for good art and illustrations and like a, and a nicely like put together book, like good quality book. I even love how you open it up just the in, just right away. Just charming. The kids have opened these up already and they'll just stare at these pictures just looking around. So these are stories and poems. They say in the foreword, my book house was definitely and consciously prepared to help educate children from the very earliest possible moment to meet life by calling out in them those qualities which make for the richest and fullest life. Therefore, at each successive and varying stage of the child's development, you will find in my book house the necessary material to use in approaching the one great problem which always remains the same. That is, how can we best assist the child to meet life and adjust himself to it? So she said they've tried to gather the best literature from the greatest authors of the past and present, folk tales, um, avoiding those tales where evil traits of character such as lying and cheating to gain one ends have been made to appear good. I have chosen only those who are truly desirable qualities invite the child's admiration. That's what I'm looking for. That is what I'm looking for, right? I don't want to fill their head with immoral uh, examples being praised. So you can read this, this one you could like read to them, you know, right from the very beginning. So they've got contents in here, ABC, Kitties in the Snow I See, African Child Rhymes, Blessings on Thee, Dog of Mine, Butterflies, Butterflies. There's so many in here. And so they're mostly nursery rhymes, okay? But look at the illustrations. Oh, it's 
so beautiful. I want to be charmed by the books too. Like when I pick books, it's not just for the kids, it's for me too. <laughs> oh, I love it. They're so colorful. There are black and white ones too, but I like that there's a lot of um, colored illustrations. They try to include things from around the world, East Indian rhymes. Okay, anyways, that's book one. They progress, they're progressive. Okay, this, I jumped up to book six, it was right in the middle, Through Fairy Halls. Beautiful. It says, Through Fairy Halls is intended for boys and girls who have reached an age when the fantastic adventures of folk tales with their dramatic and heroic action have enormous appeal to youthful imaginations. So there's stories from different countries again, the princess on the glass hill from Norse folklore, the lost spear from South Africa, the strong boy, a Canadian folk tale about an Indian boy, um, humorous stories such as the squire's bride and the Spanish fairy tale, the three wishes. Some of those beautiful illustrations. Here's a, a pigling and her proud sister, a Korean Cinderella tale. Mmm, Jack the Giant Killer. Okay, that's book six. And then I jumped all the way to the end to book 12 called Halls of Fame. When a child reads the stories in Halls of Fame, he will see that behind every great achievement is one person's struggle to accomplish it. We hope he will see that outstanding men and women as children were much like himself. One of the important goals of Halls of Fame is to bring to the young person the realization that many of the most interesting things in life are attainable goals for him. Halls of Fame is full of possible dreams. So the Royal Page is a story about Chaucer. He was the first recognized poet to write in English um, in an era where educated English people spoke and wrote French. Washington Irving. So the tale of Jackie Robinson, Jesse Owens, Babe Didrikson. So people who would, real people who achieve their dreams, right? Through hard work. So this is a courtroom in Venice. <laughs> so yeah, they just seem, they're beautiful. They, the, the stories aren't too long. It's our American hero. Anyways, so this is a new purchase for us. I've been wanting to get them for a long time. And, um, finally did. So I'm glad to add these to our collections. These are things, um, you know, stuff like this is not on the RC book list, but I keep it down low so the kids can grab it for free reading time. And also like, I may just grab this and read it. Um, being based in the Robinson curriculum, we do not watch TV, um, during the week. Like there's no TV, no video games. So in the evening, there's a lot of us, we still come to the school room because if you saw my, I'll link it below, but my homeschool room tour, this was our living room and I just converted the living room into the school room. And so we do so much more living in this room now that it's the school room than when it was the living room. Um, when it was the living room, it was just the make messes and veg out in front of the TV <laughs> room. So now though, like it's really common because I have all their like drawing materials in here and stuff and uh, William and Bo right now are like really into drawing like all the time. They want to draw constantly. When you take TV out of the equation and like, you know, iPads and all that, all that stuff, it's amazing what they will just start doing. Like they'll just start playing games. They will pick up books in here. They'll come sit in here and just grab um, one of my science reference books or some of our readers like these. Like they'll just grab stuff that's interesting to them. They really like, I have some like science, I'll show them to you, um, type of um, coffee table sort of books. And they're just constantly opening that stuff up and just sitting down and reading it and looking at the pictures and drawing. And, and so like it's really common if, you know, there's like some downtime in the day and the kids are here drawing or something. I'll come in here and say, do you guys want me to read you a story? And I'll just grab something like this and 
will have a quick story because they always like it, especially the ones that have good illustrations. Like, they want to see something. Ooh, chimps. Jane and the Wild Ch Chimps. Baroness Jane Van Lawick Goodall. I didn't know she was a baroness. Do you guys know Jane Goodall was a baroness? Anyways, I'm gonna go put these back and let's see. I'll jump up a shelf to the science shelf and I'll show you something that is a more recent purchase as well. So I would say that the science, the science shelf gets the most um, stuff taken down that the kids just look through. So I'm just gonna show you a few things that they grab a lot. So this is something that's new um, that I'm using with my kindergartner right now to complement his Berenstain Bear Big Book of Science. So that's this set. Let's see, let's see, you can see the front. And these were recommended to me by a, an RC parent and it, they are made by Fisher Price and the like what makes something something what is something something and they're all kind of science or like nature related so what makes day and night they're called just ask books and I just again I found these used on eBay it's just questions that little kids ask because the little animals talk about it and they're not too long it's very simple language like what makes day and night so this works perfectly with so many um, topics that come up in like little science curriculums and stuff that you do so I've got what makes day and night what is gravity what is a star why does it fly why do birds sing what is a volcano what is a butterfly what is a jungle why is it hot why does it snow? Okay, you guys, there's, I still have this many. Okay, but there's just a ton, right? Oh, what are seasons? This is something that I could use right now, actually, with Beauregard, with our science stuff. Okay, so these are great. I love having these on hand to um, complement our Berenstain Bears. Something else for younger kids is this set. Oh, gosh, and I just saw that they put out another one. And I had to stop myself from buying it because it was brand new. So I'm waiting for it to be out for a while so I can get a used copy. But I love this one um, by Diana Hutz Aston and Sylvia Long. They, um, a Rock is Living. I think this is my favorite one because it's very simple. But they just have about, so you can read it to kids without like going way, way over their head. It just has beautiful, beautiful illustrations. A rock is living. Look at that. Bubbling like a pot of soup deep beneath the earth's crust, liquid, molten, boiling. It says, depending on what type of rock it is, a rock melts at temperatures between 1,300 and 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. It also gives the Celsius on there for you, for those of you who live places where you use Celsius. But then there's like an egg is quiet, a nest is noisy, a butterfly is patient. Well, I gotta look at pictures of butterflies. Oh, look at all the caterpillars. They're all different. Anyway, so I like this set too. A beetle is shy. Oh, beetles are exciting. The boys like this one. Look at those beetles. They just look like little living gems, don't they? We have June bugs around here that come out in the summer and they're pretty. But look, it shows them from egg. It says six to seven days, right? In, in star larva, in star larva, the second one. Five to seven more days, third in star larva, five to seven more days, fourth in star larva, five to seven more days, a pupa, six to eight days. You get a ladybug beetle. So then the larva begins its transformation in cocoon-like pupa where it develops wings and antenna. Finally, a beetle twists and turns, squirming free of the pupa's leathery skin and its body and true colors emerge. So I really like, you know how we're using like the copy books with Bo. All right, so he's in the second one right now. So when I'm doing school, and we're, when we get to this kind of stuff in um, 
our bear stain bears. A lot of times I'll have like, you know, pull a look around for something supplemental. So these are the kind of books that I pull from. And then I have that open-ended page. And a lot of times I just have him draw something he learned. I mean, he's only five. I can't expect essays or quizzes, right? We just talk about it and um, I have him draw something. So that's something that like, so I'll just put something like this, something really beautiful and visual and inspiring up on his little book stand. You know, and say, okay, draw about what you learned. And he could take inspiration from that or um, a lot of times he'll make up his own picture, but like they're just really useful and easy and like don't require any prep. Doing, I love doing that, like just giving them, reading to them, maybe watching a video and then letting them look at the book while they draw to reflect what they learned about. The last one I have is A Seed is Sleepy. I must be hungry because I looked at that and I was like, that seed looks like a hamburger. <laughs> Okay, so there's those ones. I love that set. Okay, some I think I may have showed some of these before, but uh, they still grab this book down a lot, Mammoth Science. It's a DK book. The Big Ideas That Explain Our World. So I mean, this is one of the ones I see um, that William and Everett just take down and, and look through all the time. Like, it's pretty common. And then the Science Year by Year one. So this is like... You can just see technology through time, right? And how it's changing in different parts of the world, and advancements, so many pictures. Right. Cool, huh? And then last from the science shelf, whoops. Stuff that um, gets picked up a lot by William and Everett are these. So these were gifted one Christmas from our um, from their aunt. The book of potentially catastrophic science, 50 experiments for daring young scientists. Um, totally irresponsible science. So I think the kids, I think they like the artwork and stuff on the front like very 50s or something but they'll look through here and they'll be just like looking look at this one <laughs> reinforced rice look at the lady's face <laughs> this wonderful counterintuitive experiment can be performed in a matter of a few seconds especially if you keep your rice in the right type of jar there's something primal and moving about it, which might explain why unscrupulous sorcerers and days long past would claim magic powers when performing this trick. You will need one pint plastic jar, two pounds of uncooked rice, or enough to fill the jar and a sharp knife. Fill the jar with rice. Repeatedly plunge the knife halfway into the rice, preferably at an angle. Jab the knife fully into the rice. Pull straight up on the knife and it will mysteriously carry the jar of rice with it. That's a pretty simple one. And then it gets the scientific excuse. It'll give some explanation. So yeah, there a lot of these are stuff that you will probably have around the house. I am not one to go running around picking up a bunch of stuff for science experiments. Like it needs to be stuff that's around the house or that's like easily, like I tell the kids, if there's something you wanna do in here, like I think, like I'm not, I'm not gonna like plan these things out or I have enough of my plate, but I'm like if there's something you look in here and there's something you want to do, if you're really old enough to do it, ready to do it, mature enough to do it, then you will write down what you need. You'll go check and see if we have it in the house. And if we don't, you'll write it down on my grocery list because I have uh, a running grocery list on my little magnetic pad on my refrigerator. <laughs> so write down what you would need me to pick up from the grocery store or whatever. So. And then, and then I'll get it for you and it, we will, and if you are mature enough, like you can do these in your own free time. Like, so this is for them on their own free time. I just let them have control of stuff that they want to do. And they have done some stuff, but they look at these a lot. Okay. And then I have a bunch of these too. So the next stuff up still in the kind of science realm, um, who was Ben Franklin, who was Henry Ford. I know I don't always science science, but you know, he was famous for his uh, coming up with the process um, for his assembly line and stuff. And I was like, I felt like that was a little scientific, but um, 
obviously Einstein, Galileo, uh, Marie Curie, Isaac Newton, um, Thomas Edison, and Nikola Tesla. So we love those. They can, I mean, my oldest son can read these, you know, in one sitting. They are super fun, super cheap. Um, buy them on Amazon. I'll try to link all the stuff I showed you today just to make it easy if you want to go look at stuff. So I also have the Julia Rothman, like anatomy of this or that kind of thing um, on here. I do like these. Um, my favorite one so far is by far Nature Anatomy. And I have all the activity books that go with it. Let me show you one real quick. So I actually think you can really do a lot with these activity books that they're not written by the same people, but they're written to be companions for them. Like I loved the nature anatomy activities for kids. Um, I had really good activities. It still gave a ton of information. The lessons were, it, it tell, and it, you know, you can go through the lessons. So I also bought the um, notebooking pages that went with this, which I did like because um, these are, um, these kind of books, they, this, they do talk about like evolution and stuff. And so if there's certain things that you want to not, that you don't agree with or something, the notebooks skip cer certain um, topics. So it's up to you because I think it's the, to me, for me, the problem is not discussing things like evolution. It's the way it's discussed, right? So I want a more accurate discussion, a more precise discussion than what books like this um, give. It's not a discussion. It's just a conclusion. So um, this is my new one though. And I don't, I haven't gotten, I don't know if there are any activity books so far, you know, because this was like new. Um, we haven't used it yet, yet, but the curious lives and features of wild animals around the world. So I was really interested in seeing more animals around the world and learning about them. And yeah, I do like these books, but like, I think you could get, like these had such good, um, my favorite ones for activities where I, so we had so much fun with the ocean activities and the nature activities I really like these a lot and yeah you could you could totally just get these too but I have all of it and then last is the answers in Genesis set covers creation uh, versus evolution or and evolution in the Bible but they go over different questions in each one I, I haven't used these I haven't read these yet and the last one is a flood of evidence 40 reasons knowing the ark still matter so I'm gonna read these. I have these on my science um, schedule. I wanna say for eighth grade, I think, I believe. So I still have like a year before I do them with my oldest. So I want to read these all this year before we talk about this stuff together and have him read these himself. Okay, so that was three shelves worth of base. I didn't show you every single thing, but like that was a good sampling. If there's anything I showed you today that you would like to see closer, um, leave me a comment and I'll make you a special video.